Well, good morning. Do you uh, remember all the way back to last Sunday, that theological term that I taught us, that, that new Greek word? Who can pronounce it? Parousia. Parousia. What does it mean? Arrival. Appearing. It's a theological term for the second coming of Christ. As Christians, orthodoxy encompasses the person and work of Jesus Christ. Certain things all Christians believe, his incarnation. Jesus was not created, but begotten. The only begotten of the Father, fully God, fully man, without confusion, came to earth, lived the life that we could not live, died in our place on the cross, absorbing the just wrath of God, so that mercy might be extended. He took upon himself our punishment, rose again the third day, ascended into heaven, and what else? Is coming back. So all Christians believe that Christ is coming again. He is coming to rescue the righteous and judge the wicked. Not that we're innately righteous, but we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. If you have repented of your sins and placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are imputed with Christ's righteous, righteousness. You stand before God. The penalty has been paid. So Christ is coming back. As we read this book of Revelation, we realize this is vastly different from other genres in the Bible, isn't it? I mean, think about historical narratives, the Gospels, poetry, the epistles, and then we have apocalyptic literature or prophetic literature. And it's very symbolic. And, and as Chris was reading this, you're probably thinking, whoa, wh what are these pictures? What, what, what are these symbols that I'm looking at? Well, that's what they are. They are symbols. They're allegorical. They, they have meanings behind them. And the purpose of this book is not to understand every exact application of this prophecy, but it is meant to produce in us a desire to overcome amid persecution. That's the theme of the book. It's written to the persecuted church to overcome, to stay the course, to hang in there, to stand with Christ and for Christ as an ambassador, calling a lost and dying world to follow him while we await his return. And that's what's so exciting here is we get to Revelation 19 and we see what it's like when he comes back. But there's a lot of pastors that as they get into this, they sort of get lost in the weeds. And yet this passage, Revelation 19, Christ's return, his long awaited return has a meaning for us today. In fact, it had a meaning for the church in the Middle Ages. It had a meaning for the church in the first century. You don't have to live in the end times for this to have purpose. In fact, the truth is good for all generations. So we're gonna spend three weeks, as I mentioned, in Revelation 19, and uh, I would like to, before we get into today, tell you why this is here. So turn with me, if you will, back to Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to set the stage for this text today, specifically as we look at the characteristics of our Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 16. And as you're turning there, I'll recount what's going on. You'll remember Christ is having a conversation with his apostles, but specifically Peter. And he has asked the question, who do men say that I am? And of course, Peter, he's always the quiet one, right? He speaks up. What does he say in verse 16? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. It is Peter's confession and he gets it right. He gets a lot wrong in his life. He gets this one right. And yet there's this strange admonition in verse 20. Jesus tells him and his disciples to keep quiet about this. Now, that's unusual. It's like the teacher has just asked a difficult question. The student got it right. Everyone understands it now. And he says, I want you to keep it quiet. 
Verse 20, he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. You see, before Peter and the apostles can proclaim this revelation, they must count the cost. They must count the cost. Though Peter realizes that Jesus is indeed the long-awaited Messiah, and in fact, even that he is God, he does not yet understand either the road to the cross or what it will cost him to follow Christ. And so in verse 21, Jesus begins to explain the way of the cross. Look at it with me. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Wow. Wow. You got to realize how unusual that is. P, Peter just proclaims Jesus is the Amashia, the Christ, the King. Kings don't die, kings don't lose. So, what happens here? Does Peter understand it all? Does he then get to, get to proclaim Christ? No. Look what Peter does in verse 22. We know it well. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. And of course, you remember Jesus rebukes him for his demonic thinking. Get behind me, Satan. Christ explains then to them, that he must die. He must suffer. This is why he came. And in fact, if you are to follow him as his disciple, what is disciple? A learner, a follower. We are disciples of Christ. We're not the apostles, but we are disciples of Christ. We're followers. And he says in verse 24, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Peter, it's not enough to understand that I am the Messiah. It is not enough to understand that I am the long-awaited fulfillment of the prophecy. In order for you to really have this travel the 18 inches to the heart, you must be willing to take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. Following Christ will cost. Salvation is free, but discipleship may cost you your life. But what's interesting is that it's not the followers of Christ who lose. We actually win. Look at verse 25. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So now put yourself in the sandals of the uh, disciples. What do the rest of their lives look like? Is it all teacups and rose petals and yellow brick road? No. Tough times are ahead. Difficult times await them. They may understand now who Jesus is. They may even understand what suffering he will go through. But are they really prepared to endure suffering? I would say no. Would you agree with me? And so Christ in his mercy and in his grace is going to do something that will help equip them to overcome. Equip them to suffer well. Give them the help they need so that when they are in the vice, they will endure. They will bear up under. He's going to give them a glimpse. A glimpse of his glory. In fact, he prophesies about it in verse 28. 
Truly, I say to you that there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel like I could endure a lot more persecution if I could just see Jesus. Especially if I could see the glorified Jesus. Don't you think? If I knew that I really, really saw him, that when times got tough, it's like, I know, I know he's real. I know he's promised that he's coming back. And I saw him. I can endure. Don't you think? Well, watch what Matthew does in the very next verse. Remember, there's no chapter breaks until the Middle Ages. Verse 1, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up into a high mountain by themselves. And he was, what? Transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. Jesus peeled back his flesh, as it were, and gave them a glimpse of his glory. Can you imagine can you imagine? Do you think that made a difference later on in life? Do you think Peter, James, and John thought about this when they were enduring persecution? I bet they did. I'm confident they did. So much so, watch this, turn all the way over to 2 Peter. We're going to get to Revelation. Hang with me. 2 Peter chapter 1, and look at verse 13. Almost to the end of the New Testament there. Peter is passing the baton. He knows his days are numbered. Verse 13, I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. He's saying, listen to me. I'm not always going to be around. I really want you to be able to persevere until the end. He's calling them to persevere, to stay the course. Now watch how he does it in verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made by him, was made to him by the majestic glo glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. I was there. I saw it. I'm reminding you that this glimpse that I have seen has carried me through. But you know what? As great as that is, look at the next verse. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you will do well to pay attention to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. The word of God is true. I'm about to depart this earth. Peter was martyred. Tradition says he was hung on a cross upside down because he did not feel worthy to die in the same manner as his master. He wants these folks, these believers to stay the course. He's reminding them of the glimpse of the glory and they have even more than that, the word, which God's word never fails. Do you think it made a difference? I do. I think throughout Peter's life, throughout James's life, James and Peter were both martyred. John lived to be an old man, but, but he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, when he wrote uh, the book of Revelation, they'd been through tough times. I think at their weakest moment, they thought, Jesus is coming back. And I've had a glimpse. 
I know it's real. I think that's what John is doing in chapter 19. I think he's giving us a glimpse of Christ's glory. Remember, the whole book of Revelation is about overcoming, persevering. Don't quit. Don't take the mark. And he said, I'm going to give you a glimpse of what is to come. And that's what we have with these characteristics. Turn back, Revelation chapter 19, and we'll look at it together. This picture of the parousia, of the appearing, of the arrival, is meant to do the same for us. Our timeless truth is seeing Christ in his glory will give us confidence to face our enemies. Let me say that again. Seeing Christ in his glory will give us confidence to face our enemies. Would you pray with me and we'll look at the text together? Father in heaven, we ask that you would bless our time. That you would give me the words to say that I would cut it straight, that I would stay out of the way of the text, and I would let your prophetic word do its work. Help us to understand as best we can the meaning behind the symbols, how you have given us this inspired word to encourage your persecuted church throughout all ages to endure until you come, until you send the Lord Jesus Christ to come for us, to rescue the righteous, and to judge the wicked. We thank you, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. Well, last week, just briefly, I took selected scriptures throughout the New Testament so that we could round out the second coming. What we see in Revelation 19 is primarily Christ coming and judging the wicked. He is fulfilling the prayers of the martyrs who cried out under the altar, How long, O Lord? How long are you going to let this go on? How long before you vindicate us? Well, that day has come, and there will be hell to pay, literally. But what we saw last week was the rescuing the righteous part. And we took selected passages, the Olivet Discourse, uh, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and other passages, and we looked at how Christ will rescue or snatch up his church when he returns. The world awakes to the blast of a trumpet, the booming voice of an archangel, the heavens split, revealing a heavenly army and an entourage led by a warrior king, a parousia, an arrival. In the same way, in the ancient days, an emperor or a general would come into town and the entire town would come out to greet him. And he would be on a white horse and there would be celebrations and confirmation that this victory is real. This is what we see. On earth, the armies of the world have gathered against Jerusalem, and now they turn their ire towards a divine foe, towards Jesus Christ. As we focus this week on verses 11 through 16, we're going to see 12 characteristics of our glorified Christ. We're going to get a glimpse of his glory so that we will endure, so that we'll overcome. But a lot of us look at this and we're a little confused because this doesn't look like the Jesus we see in the Gospels. In, in fact, it, it seems a little contradictory. But we must understand there are not two Jesuses. That he came for the first time to atone for our sin and he's coming back as a conquering king. But he is one and the same. Mercy and justice are not at odds. They are not contradictory. Mercy and justice are complementary. In fact, with a holy God, justice must be satisfied in order for mercy to be extended. And those who refuse mercy will have justice satisfied. Does that make sense? Let's, look about, let's think about Jesus' first advent. What do we know about it? Well, the son of a carpenter, who was a carpenter himself, or perhaps better might be understood as a stonemason, 
There's not many trees in Palestine. But he was a man who at about the age of 30 started his ministry. And we see him do everything from giving sight to the blind, causing the lame to walk, weeping with those who weep, rebuking the storm, changing the weather, raising Lazarus from the dead, clearing the temple with a whip, defeating one of the most powerful created beings, Satan, with just words. I would say if there ever was a Renaissance man, Jesus was it. The consummate shepherd, tender with his own, and yet truly a man's man. He was comfortable with commercial fishermen, tax collectors, revolutionaries, and yet he could run circles around PhDs. And if the real measure of a man is one who keeps his word and protects the neediest of us all while defeating the evildoers, well, that's Jesus, isn't it? And so as we look at these verses, let's think about it like Peter, James, and John did with the transfiguration. Let's look beyond what we think we see into what he really is, his majesty, his glory, his power. He is ruler of all. We see phrases like the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He is not only the redeemer, but he is the creator. Let's jump in. What's the first description we see there? He's on a white horse. In the ancient times, emperors rode a white horse as a symbol of their victory. This is not some Tennessee walking horse or a, or a Pasofino. This is a war horse. This is a horse that is massive, large, bright white, symbolizing that the conquest has been won. You know, I love history and my my favorite guy to study in history is George Washington. Washington rode a horse called Nelson. It was a chestnut. He also rode uh, blueskin during the Revolutionary War. He liked Nelson because Nelson could handle the cannon shot and it didn't bother him so much. They called him, uh, uh, he said he was a chestnut with a bit of a white front and, and white hooves. But it wasn't until he was president that he regularly rode a white horse. In fact, he owned two chargers, Prescott and Jackson. His grandson would later describe Prescott as a fine parade horse, purely white and 16 hands high. That's a big horse. Did you catch that? A parade horse. George Washington was no longer a general. He was president. The battle had been won. And so when he rode a horse, it was symbolizing the victory is done. The victory has been won. And that's what we see here. Christ is on a white horse. He is going into battle. But what is the symbolic nature of it? It's a done deal. There, there, there's, no, uh, there's no polls to see who's going to win. The victory is his. Number two, he's called faithful and true. We're going to see several names and titles for him throughout this, this text. Our king has never and will never lie. His word is unbreakable. Are you tired of getting lied to? I think if there's one thing in my life that I would like to change, is I'm sick of being lied to. By friends, by media outlets, business dealings. I, I just hate getting lied to seems like lying is everywhere, which makes sense. This is Satan's domain. He is the prince and the power of the air, and he is the father of lies. But how different Christ is. He is faithful and true. He has never lied. He never will. He's made promises that he will keep. And what is that promise? I promise that I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And now it's time to call that promise in. He's coming back. He's going to pay it. I think King David gives us this connection in Psalm 96. You don't need to turn there, but let me read it to you. 
before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Jesus is faithful and true. Let every man be a liar, but God, Jesus Christ is true. And it is that, that righteousness and that holiness and that purity that not only keeps his word, but causes him to judge rightly. Look at the third char characteristic. He judges and wages war in righteousness. No one on that day can say he's being unfair. No one can say that this justice is too harsh. No one can say that this war is not proportional. I'm so tired of hearing that. No one can say that there's, there's too much unfairness or collateral damage or whatever else. No, no. Everyone gets what they deserve. The punishment fits the crime. By this time, if they have rejected their creator king and taken the mark and chosen their own life of self-idolatry and worldliness and rejected the offer of salvation, the punishment fits the crime. The Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus Christ will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day, and to be marveled at among all who have believed. For our testimony to you was believed. There'll be no second chances on that day. His justice will be right. That's what righteousness is. Righteousness is the old English word, right wayness. He always does it righteously. Let's look at the fourth one. His eyes are a flame of fire. You know, it's interesting when you look at this, if you've ever tried to read Revelation on your own, you're like, ah, should I draw a picture? Because it'd be a really strange picture with flaming eyes of fire, a sword coming out of his mouth. No, no, that's not the purpose. In fact, it's, 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 it's really almost blasphemous to try that. These are symbols. It's apocalyptic literature, and it was meant to be understood according to the symbols. Some of the, the, the sword out of the mouth is obvious. It's his spoken word and the power of it. Some of the other ones here we don't necessarily understand, <clears throat> but we need to go back and see what the Bible has said about this before. And when you see what the Bible says and how it's been used there, then it makes sense. So when it says here, his eyes are a flame of fire, well, it makes sense when you understand Hebrews 4.13. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Jesus knows rightly. He sees through every facade. His eyes are a flame of fire. It means he knows what's in the hearts of men. He is omniscient. What does omniscient mean? He knows everything. Here's a difficult one. On his head are many diadems or crowns. Now we know this, right, from the, uh, the hymn, crown him with many crowns. So we, we, we kind of have a, a sense that that's not unusual, but we kind of can't imagine. Is he wearing three or four or five crowns at a time? No. If you understood this living in a monarchy in the ancient Near East, you would understand that when a king is referred to as having many crowns, that means he holds authority and dominion over multiple nations. Well, the king of kings and the Lord of lords holds dominion over all nations. So when it talks about him having many diadems or many crowns, well, I like the way Jim Hamilton says it, quote, there is no dominion, no region, no locality over which he does not reign. 
He is Lord of all and wears the crown of every place. If you've ever been to England and you've seen the crown jewels, you'll know that Queen Elizabeth didn't just have one crown. She had 12 crowns. And at her funeral, she had the crown of Scotland placed upon her casket. Isn't that interesting? She resides most of the time in England, but she chose to have the crown of Scotland sitting on her casket. What does that say? Well, I think for her it said, not only do I have dominion over Scotland, but Scotland holds a special place in my heart. How do we know this? She spent a lot of time at Balmoral, which was her, her country residence, her castle in Scotland. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake, my soul, and sing of him who died for thee, and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Isn't it kind of fun when we study the Bible this way? When your pastor's not up here making speculative, you know, uh, conjecture about what this might be and that might be and, and the timelines and everything else, but I say the purpose of this text is to help us overcome. And if we can get a glimpse of who Jesus is, it will help us. Let me tell you who Jesus is from these symbols. It's that simple. You're supposed to, you're supposed to think, our pastor's not really that bright. Yes. Can I, can I tell you honestly? <laughs> that's not, that's not self-deprecation. That's the way the Bible is meant to be understood. It's not complicated. But you take it in small bites, you study it in community, and you study it with the purpose of changing our lives. And in doing so, this becomes worship. Here's another one. He has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. So what does that mean? Well, this is, this is unique. In the ancient Near East, to know the name of a demon or a god or even of a person was thought to have power over them. Some even believe that when, when the demons were, were naming Christ, the Holy One of God, is that they were seeking to have power over him. I don't know if that's true, but I know this, this concept was very entrenched in the ancient Near East, that if I, if I had your name, I had your power. So therefore, many demons and gods would have secret names. What's being conveyed here is, is not that Jesus has this secret name because he's afraid of someone having power over him, but it's conveying this. There is no one, there is nothing that is more powerful. This is a divinity phrase. It focuses on his ontology. It's like saying Jesus has a name that is above all other names. No one comes close to having power over him. He is the creator. We are the creation. How do we know this? Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. In these last days he has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. Do you think that might be encouraging to the persecuted church? Maybe who hasn't thought deeply about Christ's second coming. Maybe who hasn't even thought deeply about how powerful Christ is. This is not some sort of yin and yang where you have Jesus and Satan and they're kind of equally opposing forces and one's light and one's dark. No, Jesus is God of very God. He's the second person of the Trinity. He spoke the worlds into existence. Everything else is mere creation. Let's continue. Number seven. He's wearing a robe dipped in blood. Now, I bet right about now you can start to figure out what some of these symbols are. He's wearing a robe dipped in blood. Now, there's some debate about what this symbolizes. Some think it's, it's the blood that took place at the cross, so it's symbolic of his defeat over death 
and Satan at the cross, I think it's probably better to understand it. This is a foreshadowing of the conquest that is about to happen. Much like riding the white horse, the victory is won. Well, the blood of his enemies is showing that he has already defeated them. Look at Revelation 19, 15. He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God. We talked about that earlier. There's, there's this picture of the crushing of the grapes, which is in fact the blood. We're going to hit that in just a minute. But what happens when you crush grapes? Do your, sto- do your clothes stay clean? No, from, from the hymn upward, they're going to get red. It's a picture of the treading of the enemies by the wrath of God. The battle is won. Number eight, his name is called the Word of God. So we see another name, another title there. Now, who's writing this? John. First verse, Gospel John. What is it? In the beginning was the Word. Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through Him. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. You might write down, Jesus is the very personification of the Word of God, which will never fail. Number nine, He has a sharp sword coming from his mouth so that he may strike down the nations. First part of verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword. I'm going to hold off on getting into Armageddon until next week, but he literally defeats his enemies with a word. He never has to take the sword out of its sheath. He never has to swing it. He never has to actually do anything to defeat Satan, the beast, the false prophet, and the armies that have arrayed against him. All he has to do is speak, and the battle is over. And we've seen this imagery before, haven't we? When we first started in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 16. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Isaiah speaks of it as well. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. And of course, we know the verse in Hebrews, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. So the picture here is that Christ, at his second coming, will defeat the enemies, will judge the wicked with the word. He's that powerful. So now you, in the future, undergoing persecution, when times get really, really, really tough, and you feel like the adversary, and you feel like the opposition is more than you can handle, more than you can bear, you remember a glimpse of his glory and how he defeats all evil with just a word. Does that provide a little comfort? Does that give you a little strength? Does that, does that, you know, strengthen your limbs a little bit? Does it remove some of the shakiness? That the worst thing to fear is what? Death? It's momentary. It's passing from life to the presence of our Lord and Savior. There is nothing to fear. Number 10. He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. When Christ ushers in his kingdom, his rule will be known for righteousness. So his judgment will be known for righteousness. His rule will be known for righteousness. I wrote down here in my notes, and it it just fits with the season we're in. Are you weary of the political corruption out there? Even or dare I say, especially the U.S., which is supposed to be the most Christian nation worldwide, the most fair, the most honorable, I'm getting kind of sick and tired of the backroom deals. I'm getting tired of the corruption. 
I'm getting tired of the way the legal system is good for one and not another. I'm getting tired of getting lied to on the TV about decisions that have been made and people are acting like they're surprised. There's no righteousness in the rule. I remember I used to travel to Europe a lot and it really irritated me the way Europeans are so ambivalent and almost agnostic about their, uh, their government and political system. It's almost like they don't care. As long as I have my little flat, my little garden, and my little moped, and I get to go have my cappuccino here, and I get to do this, then I'm, then I'm fine, and, and, and everything up there, all the government, it's all corrupt. And it used to really irritate me. Like, don't you have passion for righteousness? Don't you want to see your country do well? I know the history of your country probably better than you do. You came from greatness. And they were just sarcastic about it. And now I kind of understand. Now I kind of like, I kind of feel the same way. There's so much corruption. And here you realize that, but when Christ comes, he will rule righteously. The imagery is taken from Psalm chapter 2. King David writes, Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. Talking about the Messiah. You shall break them with a rod of iron and you shall shatter them like earthenware. Number 11. He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God. This comes back to that imagery we saw in verse 15. John had introduced this to us in chapter 14. In fact, go ahead and turn back just a couple of pages there. Chapter 14, verse 19, we see this imagery. Again, remember, Revelation is, is more cyclical than it is linear. So we'll, like, like a good screenplay, we'll get a picture of something that will happen, and then he kind of goes back later and explains it, or, or, or later on explains it in greater detail. Verse 19, so the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and the blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles. So this was earlier on, talks about this winepress. It also kind of fits with what we talked about with the, with the blood on the robe. But the picture of this, the wrath of God is filled up. Creation, which is treasonous, has stored up the wrath of God because we've earned every sin that will be paid for. And now they're shaking their fist, even though they see the King of Kings coming and they know judgment is coming, but they think somehow they can still win. And this is what will happen. The wrath of God will be poured out. And he gives this imagery like you would pour a bunch of grapes into a vat and you would stomp them. And he says, there's so much wrath of God from the treading of the wine press that the blood will be up to a horse's bridle, about four and a half feet high. It says for a distance, your, your text may say 200 miles. The Greek actually reads 1600 stadia. I don't know if this is literal or not, but it's interesting to note. He's basically saying, the wrath and the death will be so much that there will be so much blood, it could fill a huge area, 1600 stadia. During Roman times from the north of Israel to the south, from Tyre to Egypt was about 1600 stadia. What they're saying is this is the battle to end all battles. And it will be because they have rejected the grace of God. Justice must be served. Let me take a step back because that probably seems a little unusual to us. So he put some heavy theology on you here. We like to think, as we do with our own kids sometimes, that justice doesn't have to be served, that I can, you know, maybe scold them a little bit, take a blind eye and a deaf ear to that, that issue, and we'll be fine. But that's because we're not holy and because we're bad parents too. But God is supremely holy. 
And we want to know at the end of days that justice will be served. Do you want to know that Hitler will get his just due? I think everyone says, yes. You kill six million Jews? Do you want God just saying, sorry, um, yeah, you probably shouldn't have done that. Go on your way. No, justice must be served. Why? Because of the veracity of Hitler? No, he was a terrible person. Because of the sin of Hitler? Well, yes, but not as much. Because of the character of God. Because God is supremely holy. That in order for him to be righteous, justice, he must punish sin. Otherwise, he's a respecter of persons. You've heard me say it dozens of times. This is why Islam is so bad besides being untrue. Allah is a respecter of persons. If you die and stand before Allah, you have no guarantee that you will get into paradise. A good Muslim will say, well, I hope he weighs my good works over my bad works. Well, then what does that say about Allah? In fact, if you read the Quran rightly, it depends on the mood of Allah. He's no more than a Greek God. He's not righteous because if he was righteous, he would punish sin. God Almighty has punished sin on the back of his own son so that mercy would be extended and grace would be extended. Therefore, we can stand before him and say, someone says, why should I let you into heaven? It's because the man on the cross paid my penalty. That's how come. There's no reason in and of myself or who I am. I've done nothing good. In fact, everything I did good prior to coming to Christ was for my own selfish reasons. And so this seems harsh or heavy to us, but you must understand they have rejected what the benevolent creator has offered. We were treasonous. He created us for worship. We rejected him. He went the full extra step and provided a way when we could be in fellowship with him, sacrificing his own son. And they said, heck no. And so you know, what, you know what they're getting? They're getting their paycheck. They're getting the paycheck that they earned. They're getting what they deserve. Who can say that's not fair? Number 12, you can just feel it crescendoing on his robe and on his thigh. He has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We see the same thing in verse 16 there. I, I can't read this. I mentioned a few weeks ago. I can't read this without thinking of the Hallelujah Chorus. I love Handel's Messiah. Love to go hear Handel's Messiah. And I love the Hallelujah Chorus. You know it. You've heard it. It's, it's right out of this text. King of kings forever and ever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it goes on and on. It just keeps going. And Lord of lords. And the same thing. And he shall reign. What? Forever and ever. I want you to think about how this book opens. Chapter 1, verse 5. John's writing, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the rulers of the kings of the earth. But you know what verse really comes to mind? When you say king of kings and lord of lords, something that I don't often connect. What did Christ say right before he ascended into heaven? What did Christ tell his disciples? The Great Commission. And how does the Great Commission start out? All authority. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. There is no one higher. You will bow the knee now or you will bow the knee later. Now let me pull all this together. We need a glimpse you know, it's, Christ knows our frailty, doesn't he? He knows our weakness. He knows our frame. He should be able to just give us the word of God and we should be fine. And he does. But he also gives us pictures in the word of God. Because he knows we're, 
We're, we're tactile creatures. We're visual creatures that we doubt when we shouldn't. We do believe. Help our unbelief, right? And we need a glimpse. And as followers of Christ who will face persecution for our faith, this picture of Christ fuels our faithfulness. This parousia fuels our faithfulness. You're meant to look beyond the, the strength of your adversary, the overwhelming nature of your circumstances, the weightiness of your burden, the rejection from your family and friends. You're meant to look beyond it and see a glimpse of his glory, and it's meant to strengthen your resolve. That's why this is here. But as Peter mentioned, do you know what's even better than that? His promise, the word. This is icing on the cake, the picture of Jesus, because his word never fails. I'm sure you've looked ahead, but let me read to you the last two verses of this book. Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. This text, and subsequently my job, is to comfort the afflicted. Jesus is coming back for his own. And if you're a follower of Christ, there is nothing, nothing insurmountable about your life because Jesus is coming back. And we're to take great comfort in that. But you know what else my job is? Is to afflict the comfortable. So if you're sitting in here and you have... Never bow the knee to Christ. If you're trusting in your own good works to save you, that will not get you to first base with God. But God, being rich in his mercy, with the great love which he loved us, has made a way. That but God comes on the heels of, you were dead, blind, deaf, and dumb, to the things of Christ because of your own sin. You earned, as I said, a paycheck of death. But God, while you were in this estate, not only provided a way of salvation at the cross, but he has pursued you with his word. His people have pursued you. Let me encourage you, if you are not a believer today, deal with your soul. Today, deal with it. You do not know if you will have tomorrow. I'm not trying to scare you into anything. I'm trying to get you to count the cost. Counting the cost as a Christian, Peter counting the cost was, was, was simply saying, life may be difficult, but eternity is a long time. But if you're an unbeliever, this is the only heaven you will ever know. Eternity will be beyond difficult. Take Take in a state of your soul today. Analyze it. Be honest. Are you still living for your own self and self-worship? Or are you willing to turn from your sin and bow the knee to Christ? Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.